From its humble beginnings as farmland, Queens has grown considerably to one of the most diverse and economically vibrant places in the country. Today, Queens is the second most populous borough in New York City, and is thanks to the recent development in Long Island City, Astoria, Flushing, and Elmhurst. Given the fact that Queens saw the largest growth rate of any borough, it can logically be assumed that Queens can overtake Brooklyn in population sometime soon. But to make all of this growth work, Queens needs infrastructure. A lot of infrastructure. From the rails to the roads, this helps move people and freight around. Without it, Queens is nothing. So today, let's explain the infrastructure that helps power one of the most diverse places in the world. Let's start with the New York City subway, and there aren't a whole lot. As I said multiple times, there are two and a half lines, plus a handful of other lines that extend from Brooklyn. I will go in chronological order, starting with the oldest line before going to the newest line. The first real subway line in Queens is an extension of the BMT Myrtle Avenue line. It opened in 1915 to Metropolitan Avenue. Wait, I lied. Actually, this extension opened in 1906 as a surface railroad. And under dual contracts, this portion was elevated. But surface level lines are not subway lines. So we will go with when the line was fully grade separated, which is 1915. Today, this extension is used by M trains. The next subway line to open in Queens is the IRT Flushing Line, the first of the two main subways. It also opened in 1915, between Grand Central Terminal and Vernon Boulevard, Jackson Avenue. It reused an old trolley terminal called the Steinway Tubes, which was actually in use for a demonstration in 1907, but only for a short time, as there was a circuit failure and disputes between the president of the IRT and the city. But anyway, this line would extend multiple times, and probably did the most to develop Queens. After all, this was what Queens looked like when the line was being built, and this is what Queens look like today. Today, this line is used by the 7 train, which is one of the icons of the subway system. After that, there was the Liberty Avenue L. It also opened in 1915 to Lafferts Boulevard. It was originally linked to the BMT Fulton Street L, but the city wanted to reuse this portion for their own IND Fulton Street line, and they did, opening that link in 1956. Today, this extension is used by A trains. After that, there is the Astoria line, which can be classified as half of a line. It opened in 1917 to Ditmars Boulevard. Originally, it was built for narrower IRT cars, but in 1949, the line was shaved back so that BMT trains can run on the line. Today, this line is used by N and W trains. After that, there is an extension of the BMT Jamaica line. Also opened in 1917, it extended from Cypress Hills in Brooklyn to 111th Street in Queens. It later extended to 168th Street in 1918, though most of that was torn down and was replaced by the Archer Avenue line, which I'll get to later. Today, this extension is used by the J and Z trains. Following that, there is the second and final main subway line of Queens, the IND Queens Boulevard line. Opened in 1933 as a branch of the 8th Avenue line, this line was supposed to be the main artery of Queens, with tons of branches radiating to serve other areas. However, because of the Great Depression, World War II, and Moses, that never happened. Today, this line is used by the E, F, M, and R trains. In conjunction with the Queens Boulevard line, there is the IND Crosstown line. Also opened in 1933, it enters Queens at 21st Street. It connects with the Queens Boulevard line at Queens Plaza. Today, this is used by the G train. After that, there is the 11th Street Cut. Opened in 1955, it branches from the 60th Street Tunnel and travels a short distance before merging with the Queens Boulevard line. Today, this is used by the R train. After that, there is the IND Rockway line. Opened in 1956, it reused an old LIRR line. It branches off of the Liberty Avenue L and heads south. At Broad Channel, this line branches again, with one to Rockway Park and the other to Far Rockway. Today, this is used by the A train and the Rockway Park shuttle. After the Rockway line, there is a long break of construction. The next line to open is the Archer Avenue lines in 1988. Yes, I said lines as there are two one for the IND and the other for the BMT. Anyway, this is a short line that was supposed to extend much further, but the fiscal crisis of 1975 stopped that. Today, this is used by the E, J, and Z trains. The final subway line to open is the 63rd Street line. Opened in 1989, this is also part of the program for action and linked Manhattan and Queens. 
However, it originally ended at 21st Street, Queensbridge, which to say, it wasn't useful. Therefore, a connection to QBL opened in 2001, which increased QBL capacity by 33%. Today, this is used by the F train, and with that, this is the current map we have in 2024. But wait, I do want to mention the JFK Air Train. Opened in 2003, this isn't a subway line, but is a people mover. A people mover that links Stuttman Boulevard in Howard Beach to JFK Airport. A separate fare is needed to use the air train. And now, with that, this is the current map we have in 2024. Now that we talked about the subways, let's talk about the commuter rail. The only commuter rail system that serves Queens is the Long Island Railroad, or the LIRR. Again, I will go by chronological order, and refer to each by the physical infrastructure rather than the service. The earliest to open is the Atlantic Branch. Coming in at Eldritch Lane and Atlantic Avenue, it continues east in a straight line. After Jamaica, it curves to the south and serves southeastern Queens, before leaving Queens at Rosedale. The next one is the Main Line. Open after the Atlantic Branch, it starts in western Queens, and somewhat parallels QBL. At Jamaica, the line curves to the east, and continues in a straight line. It leaves Queens after Elmont Station. The next line to open is the Port Washington Branch. In the LIRR explainer video, I said that the line starts at Winfield Junction. That is wrong. It starts in Herald Interlocking, where Amtrak branches from the main line. It splits with the main line after Woodside, and somewhat continues in a straight line. It leaves Queens after Little Neck Station. After that, there is the Montauk Branch. This branch branches off of the main line, right after the Atlantic Branch branches, and travels in a straight line. It then joins with the Atlantic Branch, and just like the Atlantic Branch, the Montauk Branch leaves Queens after Rosedale. But the Montauk Branch skips that station. So really, the Montauk Branch leaves Queens after St. Albans. Following that, there's the Belmont Park Spur. In the LIRR Explainer video, I said that this is only in service during game days. That is wrong as only special events get that service, like the Belmont Stakes. Otherwise, this spur is pretty much used as a yard. The final LIRR line to open is the east side access. Open in 2023, this isn't really a line, but a reverse branch of the main line. It links LIRR trains to the east side of Manhattan. Because Queens is not as transit rich as other boroughs, many residents would take a bus to the nearest subway station. These stations are often called transit hubs, and often play a crucial role between those bus to train connections. The first of these transit hubs is Flushing Main Street. Served by the 7 train, it is also serviced by buses that cover a large portion of northeastern Queens. Because of the magnitude of bus connections, plus the growth of Flushing as a commercial corridor, this station was not only the busiest in Queens, but also the busiest outside of Manhattan. Well, that was the case until Jackson Heights, Roosevelt Avenue, another transit hub, overtook it in 2020. But the station is still the second most used outside of Manhattan, which was why the MTA undertook a circulation improvement project in that station in 2023. Our next transit hub is the aforementioned Jackson Heights, Roosevelt Avenue station. It is where the two main Queen subway lines intersect, and is served by the 7, E, F, M, and R trains. The station serves a lot of buses coming in from central and northern Queens. But unlike Main Street, the bus terminal is built into the station complex itself. Because of the growth of Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, the station is the most used station outside of Manhattan. And that isn't counting the transfers that happen inside of the station, which to say can be a mess. Let's just say when the IBX comes along, the complex will be much busier. Our next transit hub is the only local station on this list. It is the Woodhaven Boulevard station and is served by the M and R trains. This station services a large number of buses coming in from Northeastern, Central, and South Queens, like the infamous Q52 and Q53 buses. Because of this, this station sees a large amount of people, which is why this station is always a candidate to convert from local to express. Then there's Q Gardens, served by the E and F trains. This station services some buses from eastern and southern Queens. While there isn't a whole lot compared to other transit hubs on this list, each of the bus lines individually see a fair amount of riders, like the Q10 and Q46, which combined sees 40,000 riders. Our final three transit hubs are all in Jamaica. The first of these three is Jamaica 179th Street. Located at the end of the F train, the station used to see even more buses, but when the Orchard Avenue lines opened, 
half of the buses were diverted to that station instead. Nonetheless, the station still sees a huge amount of buses coming in from southeastern and eastern Queens. The next one on this list is Stuffin Boulevard on the Archer Avenue line. Served by the E, J, and Z trains, this is where commuters transfer onto the JFK Air Train. This is also where the Jamaica Station is, which is also a hub for LIRR trains as it sits at the intersection of so many lines. To add to the chaos, there is also a huge amount of bus lines servicing a large portion of Queens. The final one is Jamaica Center, which is also served by the E, J, and Z trains. This isn't an LIRR nor an airport hub like Stuffin Boulevard, but is a massive transit hub for buses. A large number of buses going to Southeast Queens start and end here, which is why the MTA implemented a busway on Archer Avenue sometime in the 2020s. Now that we talked about the commuter rail, let's talk about how freight is moved. For that, there are multiple railroads and highways for freight to move on. Since we're on the topic of rail, we will first talk about the freight railroads. The first one is the Lower Montauk Branch. This runs east-west and central Queens. It used to see passenger trains, but once the Penn Station opened in 1910, and with trains now taking the LIRR main line, freight service started to take over. With this, passenger service saw a slow decline. All stations were removed on the line in 1998, and passenger service ended in 2012. Today, it is fully dedicated to freight. However, there are proposals to use this rail corridor for light rail, so we will wait and see what will happen. The second one is the Bay Ridge Branch, which runs north to south. This has the same backstory to the Lower Montauk Branch, built as a passenger railroad, then was converted to freight in 1924. But what separates this from the Lower Montauk Branch is that the right of way for the Bay Ridge Branch is being pursued for the IBX, which should be at least heavy rail. The final one is the New York Connecting Railroad. This connects with the Bay Ridge Branch at its northern endpoint and runs north, across the Hellgate Bridge and into the Bronx. This line is pretty important to freight in Queens, as it connects Queens with the rest of the freight network. Now that we talked about the railroads, let's talk about the roads. Since there are 2,000 miles of roads in Queens, I am going to go over the major roads. I am first going to go over the north-south roads before going over the east-west roads. The first one is the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Located in central and northwest Queens, it runs north to south. It starts in Astoria and winds its way in the center of Queens, before swaying to the west. It passes through cemeteries before interchanging with the Long Island Expressway. And after that, it enters Brooklyn. The next one is the Whitestone Expressway. This expressway runs north-south in Whitestone. After that, it ends and is known as the Van Wyck Expressway. This expressway continues to run south until it reaches JFK Airport. Another north-south highway is the Clearview Expressway. This expressway runs north to south in eastern Queens, but doesn't go the entire length of Queens, ending abruptly at Hillside Avenue. The final north-south highway is the Cross Island Parkway. This highway branches off the Whitestone Expressway and travels east-west before traveling north-south. It is located on the far east side of Queens, sometimes right on the border of Queens and Nassau County. It ends once it merges with Belt Parkway. Now, let's talk about the east-west highways. The first one is the Grand Central Parkway. This splits off of the BQE and serves LaGoria Airport. After that, it turns south, running along the west side of the Flushing Meadow Corona Park, and then swings to the east on this massive interchange, and then goes on for a while before entering Nassau County. The next one is the Long Island Expressway. Located in central and eastern Queens, it starts in Long Island City, and runs more or less in a straight line to the east before exiting Queens and entering Nassau County. After that, there is the Jackie Robinson Parkway. Located in southern Queens, it travels through mostly Highland Park. It ends at this massive interchange at Kew Gardens, where the Jackie Robinson Parkway, the Grand Central Parkway, and Van Wyck Expressways meet. Finally, there is Belt Parkway. Entering Queens at Spring Creek Park, it travels east-west, passing by JFK Airport, before exiting Queens and entering Nassau County. We will also give a shout out to some major roads. There's the infamous Queens Boulevard, a mostly eight lane boulevard in the center of Queens as the East West Road. There's also Woodhaven Boulevard, a mostly eight lane boulevard that runs in central Queens, but this time as a North South Road. And finally, there is Northern Boulevard, a mostly four lane boulevard that runs in Northern Queens. Our final piece of infrastructure are the water crossings, since these roads need a way to get out of Queens, 
there are a ton of bridges and the occasional tunnel. So let's start in the north and mention the bridges in a counterclockwise direction. The first bridge is the Throg's Neck Bridge. Opened in 1961, it is a suspension bridge, carrying six lanes of traffic. It was built to relieve traffic on the Whitestone Bridge, but because of induced demand, the bridge very quickly became jammed. This bridge carries the Clearview Expressway to the Bronx. Our next bridge is the Whitestone Bridge. Opened in 1939, it is also a suspension bridge, carrying six lanes of traffic. This is where most trucks go, as the MTA banned trucks on the nearby Throg's Neck Bridge. This bridge carries both the Whitestone Expressway and across Island Parkway into the Bronx. The next bridge is the Rikers Island Bridge. Opened in 1966, it is a girder bridge, carrying three lanes of traffic. As its name implies, it connects Rikers Island with Queens, and is the only way off of the island. Next up is the Health Gate Bridge. Opened in 1917, the bridge takes on multiple forms, from being a through arch bridge to a truss bridge. This bridge does not carry cars, but trains, and is crucial for Amtrak and freight, as that is how they get into New York. After that, there is the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge. Opened in 1936, the bridge takes on multiple forms, being a suspension, lift, and truss bridge. It carries the Brooklyn Queens Expressway and the Grand Central Parkway to the Bronx and Manhattan. Following that, there is the Roosevelt Island Bridge. Opened in 1955, it is a vertical lift bridge, carrying two lanes of traffic. As the bridge name implies, it carries traffic from Roosevelt Island to Queens. Next up is the Queensboro Bridge. Opened in 1909, it is a double-deck cantilever bridge, carrying nine lanes of traffic. It connects Queens to Manhattan and used to have multiple trolley lines and an elevated line run over it. After that, there's the Queens Midtown Tunnel. Opened in 1940, it is a tunnel carrying four lanes of traffic. It carries the Long Island Expressway into Manhattan. The next one is the Pulaski Bridge. Opened in 1954, it is the Basquiel Bridge, carrying five lanes of traffic. It connects Brooklyn and Queens, specifically McGinnis Boulevard in Brooklyn to 11th Street in Queens. The next one is the Greenpoint Avenue Bridge, the first iteration opened in the 1850s, but was replaced multiple times. The latest iteration opened in 1987, and carries Greenpoint Avenue from Brooklyn to Queens. After that, there's the Cayusco Bridge. The first iteration opened in 1939, but after the bridge exceeded its useful lifespan, it was replaced in the 2010s. It was done in two phases, with the first phase building a new bridge, while the second phase would demolish the old bridge and build another bridge next to it. The project was finished in 2019, but it wasn't done without controversy. Native American tribes were not notified of the bridge replacement. The new bike infrastructure on the bridge didn't really connect to existing bike infrastructure, and the bridge suffered from induced demand. The next bridge is the oldest standing bridge in Queens. It is the Grand Avenue Bridge, with the current iteration opened in 1903. Carrying two lanes of traffic, it is a swing bridge. It connects Grand Street in Brooklyn with Grand Avenue in Queens. After that is the Betts Creek Bridge. I can't verify exactly when this was built, but either 1940 to 1941 would be my guess. Carrying six lanes of traffic, it brings Belt Parkway from Brooklyn to Queens. Next up is the Marine Parkway Bridge. Opened in 1937, it is a vertical lift bridge. It connects the Rockways with southeastern Brooklyn. The next bridge is the North Channel Bridge. Opened in 1993, it replaced the older iteration of the bridge. It connects the Queen's mainland with Broad Channel. The North Channel Bridge connects with the Cross Bay Veterans Memorial Bridge. That bridge opened in 1970. It too replaced an older iteration of the bridge. It connects Broad Channel with the Rockways. The final bridge is a Rockway Trestle. Opened in 1880, it used to carry LIRR trains to the Rockways. However, that bridge would always catch on fire. And after a 1950 fire, the LIRR sold that bridge and half the Rockway Beach branch to the city. The city completely rebuilt the bridge, and the current bridge opened in 1956, carrying eight trains to the Rockways. And with that, that marks every water crossing in Queens. In conclusion, there are many components of infrastructure that move people and freight in Queens. This explainer only just scratches the surface. I hope that you appreciate how much infrastructure there is in Queens. Though Queens is in need of an infrastructure revolution. If you'd like to see that, let us know in the comments below. And with that, this marks the end of this video. What are your thoughts on Queens infrastructure? Let us know in the comments below. 
And if you like this video, consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.